we'll see we'll see these three forms bending magnet wiggler and undulator radiation in general the phrase synchrotron radiation refers to electrons um, crossing a magnetic field then there's a v cross b term and there's acceleration and there's acceleration there's radiation and that's called synchrotron radiation uh, so for instance there's lots of synchrotron radiation in the galaxy lots of charged particles lots of magnetic fields and so it's important there we'll see these three forms of radiation and we'll talk about them more then they'll make more sense with the diagram um, this is a diag we're going to come back to this diagram one of my favorites about why we see short wavelengths and we'll talk about the diagrams again for undulator radiation and uh, these are just formulas of where we're going with the magnetic with bending magnet radiation which there are many bending magnets at all the synchrotrons so many i think the als must have of order 20. Um, so they're commonly used the mathematical derivation of synchrotron radiation is non-trivial you definitely have to get into complicated electrodynamics of relativistic particles whereas the undulator radiation which is much more interesting turns out to be not quite trivial but really easy and wiggler radiation will turn out to be very similar to bending magnet radiation so again we won't derive it but there's a simple relationship between them and i'll at least tell you what they are uh, wiggler radiation was very important in the early days of synchrotrons but it's less and less important now and in fact in general it plays little or no role at the most modern synchrotrons so the undulators will be the main event and lots of work at bending magnets and we should appreciate why <clears throat> and again i mentioned this before almost all of the elements on the periodic chart can be have their properties addressed with synchrotron radiation the exceptions might be hydrogen and helium just because the photon energies the relevant absorption edges are so low but when you get up to beryllium boron carbon you're in the game okay. and so basically there are so many elements here that have been used that have have been have been analyzed or studied as synchrotron so um, okay so uh, here's our here's our diagram of a periodic magnet structure which for the most part we're going to refer to as an undulator and so there's a periodic magnetic field a uh, vertical magnetic field you notice it's pointing down here down then there's the closing the loop it's the magnetic field is vertical positive going up going around so the magnetic field is vertical uh, down up down up and so there's a periodic magnetic field here or at least approximately so with these magnet structures and um, the the period we call lambda u undulated period the wavelength can i move this ah. whoa, whoa, whoa. the wavelength we'll call lambda okay um, but the undulated period we'll call lambda u the number of magnet periods we'll call capital N. For in this course, a capital N is always just a pure number. So for our undulators, um, we'll typically be between, between 50 and 100 or even 200. Okay. And the periods will be <coughs> typically three to five centimeters, but some am more ambitious ones are two centimeters or 2.5 centimeters or something uh, the shorter it is the harder the x-rays people would love to get there why don't they make this even one centimeter that would get us even harder x-rays and the reason is that if this gets very short the gap has to be smaller to maintain this magnetic circuitry so you'd have to close the different the distance between the the upper uh, magnet structure and the lower magnet structure and what happens is although the beam the electron beam coming through is relatively small it has long Gaussian tails and those Gaussian tails will get uh, will wind up exposing the magnet structure not so much to damage it but those electrons will be knocked out of the beam and you know these things are going around um, the uh, 
this, this so-called storage ring facility. In fact, we call it a synchrotron radiation facility. The, the vacuum vessel where the electrons go around, not in a, a circle, but some regular polygon, uh, we call that the storage ring because it stores the electrons that go around for many, many cycles. So for instance, you can fill a storage ring and it will go, depending on whether it's soft or hard x-rays, it'll go for many hours, hard x-ray facility, maybe even a day, where the electrons have so infrequent inter interaction that they get knocked out of the beam that the current stays relatively strong for a long time. So anyway, we can't make, if we try to make these, this gap smaller to get shorter periods and harder x-rays, uh, we pay a price in lifetime with the beam. You, could, you know, it can go down a lot, yeah, for instance, an hour or something like that. So quite importantly, oh yeah, we'll say that the radiation is in a, uh, has a half angle of theta, full angle of two theta. It turns out that working with half angles is most convenient for undulator radiation. Okay. And the other important parameter then is the electron energy coming in here. So we can, the electron energy uh, is written relativistically as gamma multiplied by the rest energy, mc squared. Gamma is our usual uh, Lorentz contraction factor, Lorentz factor, one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. And for instance, this is a good point, a good time for me to make the point that's gonna be arise soon is, if gamma was only one, or some low number, some, rel some rel non-relativistic velocity coming through here, some velocity v. Again, there's gonna be a v cross b term, a Lorentz force. Uh, the velocity is the motion of the electron along the z-axis. The b is the magnetic field on axis. And the v cross b leads to is an, an acceleration and it's in the lateral plane. So if this were z and this were y going up for the magnetic field, then you would have an oscillation x out of the board. And if this electron energy were, uh, were non-relativistic, it was coming through here. So suppose the electron comes through and because of its velocity and this period, suppose it has um, an oscillation period of lambda u. It's, if it's rel non-relativistic, it's going to radiate at whatever frequency that is. So take a lambda u divided by v, whatever that is, you're going to get some frequency. And if this is centimeters, you're going to wind up radiating centimeter wavelength. So does that make sense to everybody? Okay, this, it's uh, can you explain that one more time? Yeah, it's a good one to, to settle on. I've never talked about this in class before, but it struck me that um, this is good. If an electron is oscillating at some frequency here, there's some frequency of oscillation here, and what is it determined by? The undulator period and the velocity with which it came through, right? So lambda u over v, whatever v is, this is not the relativistic case, uh, that would be some frequency which is probably a really long wavelength, not x-rays, that's for sure. So there'd be some oscillating in time and we would expect to see a dipole radiation that radiated um, not in the acceleration direction, but there'd be a wraparound donut, okay, as this electron moved through the thing, okay. So that's what we would see if the velocity here was much, much less than c. There would be some frequency, you just divide this, Again, if it was three centimeters and this velocity was, I don't know, 100 meters per second or something like that, figure it out. It's a frequency. That's what it would radiate at. And convert that frequency to wavelength. It's going to be something quite short. But that, in fact, is not what we see. We have relativistic electrons, and we wind up getting um, uh, frequencies which are incredibly higher, and the corresponding wavelengths are in the X-ray region, as shown here. Okay, and so today I'm hoping we're going to derive the formula for what is the wavelength on axis, what is it off axis, and what is this half angle? Why why is it so small? We had a glimpse of that at the last lecture by the half angle, 
um, by the diagram, which I'll, I'll look at again today, but um, we'll see that the central radiation cone, half angle, is quite small, one over gamma, where gamma is going to be a big number. For the ALS, it's just under 4,000. For the APS, I forget what it is, but it must be close to 11 or 12,000, okay? And this, within this central cone, the, in fact, the way it is um, defined, it is defined as that angle that contains a one over n bandwidth, okay? So that might be a lot to swallow, but it's going to come to you over and over again. So this is a, a new slide I made up. How is it possible that electrons oscillating as they, tra as they traverse a periodic magnet structure of, of several centimeters period, how is it they do not radiate centimeter wavelengths or even micro longer wavelengths? How is it that that's not the case? Okay. Rather, they radiate in the extreme ultraviolet and X-ray regions. So that, that could be a puzzle. And how is it that these oscillating electrons appear to radiate into a very narrow um, uh, half-angle half cone of microradiance, 20, 30 microradians, okay? rather than a fat donut pattern? So what's going on there? So those two are tied up with this diagram. It's, it's a very visual answer to those questions, and we're going to follow it up with algebra to uh, relativistically correct algebra, but pretty simple, to figure out what's going on. So here's our oscillating electron in and out of the board producing um, uh, spherical wavefronts or circular wavefronts, and uh, it's basically a donut pattern, okay? Uh, but so these uh, these um, circular wavefronts in the plane are propagating in both directions, and if the object, the oscillating electron, is moving in this direction at some velocity much less than c, then we know there'll be a Doppler shift. And if we look back from here, it's like the whistle on a train. We'll see a shorter wavelength given by the Doppler the Doppler formula. So for a velocity v over c. And a cosine, this, is, this would be, the angles would be arranged here to be measured from this axis. So cosine theta forward would be, this would be a one. So this would be a, a usual Doppler shift, exactly as you learned about it in high school, okay? What we didn't learn about then was what happens if this oscillating electron, as it's going in and out of the board, is also moving at a velocity that's quite high so high that the wave fronts it's radiating, these circular wave fronts, can, can hardly get away from the oscillating electron itself. So they start bunching up. So here, you know, it radiates this, uh, here, this outer, outer circle, and then it keeps radiating again, circles of constant phase, and, uh, and they're just piling up on, on axis. So again, that's because the electrons are moving at a velocity v, which is close to c, but a little less, and the wave fronts are going at c, so there's a difference. The wave fronts are getting away, but they're not getting away that far. And we're going to go through some algebra to figure out exactly what that is. But um, so that's, uh, this is an explanation in, in part, or it's a, an interpretation, physical interpretation, of why we get short wavelengths on axes, why we didn't get one centimeter wavelengths, why do we get X-rays or EUV out of it? And the other thing is there's a strong angular dependence. So this is again, it's a Doppler shift, and you know the Doppler shift, classically and relativistically, has some angular dependence to it. Okay, and which we can see here physically if you're looking at it, the radiation coming straight at you, it's a very short wavelength. Look at the distance between the phase fronts. But if you're looking off at some angle here, the wavelength is different. The, 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 uh, what's the distance between the different phase fronts? It's longer. So that's the angle dependent Doppler effect. And we're, we are in general interested in our experiments in producing radiation within some narrow X-ray band or EUV band. So it's not only that we want X-rays or EUV, 
but we want them within some narrow band, let's say nominally 1%. In fact, if you're probing atomic resonances in your favorite atom for your PhD thesis, you probably don't even want a 1% bandwidth. You may want a monochromator there that gives you a, a probing wavelength that's more like one part in several thousand, okay? So we're, we're actually gonna have absolutely no interest in radiation outside of a very small angle, uh, that angle being the one that contains, you know, some uh, uh, characteristic spectral bandwidth. So I think that's what we can get out of this diagram. Now our task is going to be how to, how to get some numeric, how to get an equation for this and get some numbers out of it. Uh, this is just to help remind you or in a way uh, for the electron moving at slow velocity or if we said this is relativistic motion, it could be viewed in the lab or it could be viewed in the, the frame of reference moving with the electron. I think that's a phrase most of you are familiar with, maybe haven't used it in a long while, but in the frame, in the laboratory frame, or in the frame of reference moving with the electron, the electron's oscillating up and down, maybe through our undulator. This is the acceleration direction that would have been out of the board. And there's this donut pattern, okay? Okay, but in the, uh, that's in the frame moving with the electron. But in the laboratory frame of reference where our sample is, this pattern gets thrown into this very narrow forward cone. And this back part makes a little bubble, which we had a question about last, last class, a little bubble going backwards. But if gamma is, is so high, this is going to wind, this, is ang this uh, the forward cone, this thing is gonna be collapsed into a very narrow cone with all of the energy. There's gonna be very little out at other angles, although some, basically going to be nothing out the back okay and i don't know what the wavelength it is we could figure it out by this form by these formulas but um uh it's not going to be much okay. um, this is just a different way of understanding um, there's a lorentz transformation between the two frames of reference and the lorentz transformation has everything to do with what's going on in the forward direction. The horizontal direction, there is no Lorentz contraction here, uh, Lorentz transformation. So for instance, if we looked at an angle like this one here on the left going up, it's some angle, we we'll call it theta prime. So there's, um, there's an axial component of K, the radiation vector for this is K, K prime. It's in the frame of reference moving with the electron, which we're gonna call the primed frame of reference. Um, so this uh, radiation in that frame of reference has a wave vector k prime. It's at some angle theta prime. And so there's going to be two components of this wave vector. One is in the axial direction, one's in the transverse direction. When, in the, when we do the transformation to the laboratory frame, this one doesn't change. It's the same. But the axial component changes gigantically um, because we're going to shorter wavelengths basically, but this will become a, a really, this will become what's KZ prime in the frame of reference moving with the uh, electrons in the laboratory frame, it gets this factor gamma in there, in fact two gamma. And so when you look at what is the angle in this frame of, in, in the laboratory frame of reference, it's again the, the you know, the opposite over the uh, adjacent is the angle. So it's Kx, which hasn't changed. It's the same as it was in Kx prime, but Kz has changed a lot. And so we'll see that this angle, this angle here, theta prime, we just chose some arbitrary angle, but say it was maybe 45 degrees or something like that then this would be one over two gamma. So this, this is gonna be a very narrow forward cone. So a different way of viewing it before we get into the algebra. Uh, well, so here, here, just some pictures of synchrotrons. This is the ALS at Berkeley. Uh, this is ESRF, the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in Grenoble, Grenoble. Uh, it operates at 6 GeV, gamma is just about 12,000. 
it has a much bigger circumference, um, almost a kilometer. In fact, I don't know if I gave the numbers for the ALS. Oh yeah, here's, so the ALS is 1.9 GeV. Gamma, it's shown here, 3720, just under 4,000. So when we do numbers in our heads, we'll say it's 4,000. The circumference is less than 200 meters. It's a soft, so-called soft X-ray machine, and the electron energy is like a little under 2 GeV. You get here to the, the a, uh, ESRF, the French facility, at 6 GeV. Gamma is much higher. The circumference is four times as big. So why is that? And in fact, when we look at the next one, here's um, spring eight in, uh, in Japan, Hyogo Prefecture, which by the way, uh, several of you have, may even have been there already to do experiments or to use the free electron laser, which is shown shooting off here, which is known as SACLA. So we'll hear about that also. But this synchrotron is built around a mountain. They essentially carved a place around it and uh, it's at 8 GeV, gamma is almost 16,000, and now look at the circumference. So a question for you, why is the circumference getting so big as the electron energy gets higher? Remember the electron energy was gamma times mc squared. mc squared is the rest energy of an electron uh, around 500 million, right? 500, um, half a million. Um, so why, why are these rings getting so big? Does anyone want to hazard a guess or actually know the answer? Well, the, the magnet technology is the same for all of them. So the bending, someone want to speak? The, they have bending magnets all around the ring. They have a lot of straight sections, but at the end of every straight section is a bending magnet to turn it. And they're all operating with the same technology for bending magnets. There's only so many, um, uh, mag there's only so much magnetic strength you can get in Teslas. So they've all got the same magnetic field and the acceleration to turn it is this V cross V. Okay, but there's an, there's an E over M there. It turns out these, these higher energy machines have a higher uh, effective mass. You know, the mass is gamma times the rest mass. So if uh, uh, whatever that value was for the ALS, for ESRF, it's three times higher. So the effective mass of the electron is three times higher. And so with the same accelerate, with the same force, the same V cross B force being exerted, it doesn't turn so easily. It's just a, effectively a more massive particle and they need to make the circumference or the radius of the whole thing and the circumference bigger because they can't turn the electron to get into the next, next straight section, okay? And so even more so for spring eight. Uh, what else should I tell you? Uh, this is definitely out um, far from um, the cities, okay? Although the now, now surrounding it is a little science city actually, and there's housing and people live there in apartments and, they, and houses and everything else. But there wasn't much here some years ago when it started, they had to get people to put up the money to build it. And those, the very first thing that they got built um, was the golf course. <laughs> and yeah. Okay, so this is a diagram of a so-called modern synchrotron radiation source. It's called third generation, um, which is interesting, but not so interesting. But anyway, all of these modern synchrotrons have a bunch of straight sections. This is just arbitrarily shown as an octagon. But for instance, the ALS is 12-sided. I think APS is 20-sided, uh, et cetera. And what they have is they have these uh, undulated magnet structures, periodic magnet structures in some section here. So there's electrons going around. This diagram doesn't show you how they got in there, but somehow or other, the electrons are brought up to energy, injected into the ring. They feel the magnetic field, and then they start traveling along, and they get bent by a, a, a vertical magnetic field here. 
So there's a V cross B turn at just enough to turn the electrons into the next straight section and again into the next straight section. But within each straight section, you can have a periodic magnet, an undulator, um, but they can have different periods. And if the periods are short, you produce x-rays. If the periods are a little bit longer, as here, you'll produce ultraviolet radiation or vacuum ultraviolet radiation. So for instance, um, the chemistry people have a beam line here with a relatively long period. I think maybe lambda U was, um, I think 10 centimeters. It could have been eight, but I think 10 centimeters. It was led by Yuan Li, Y.T. Li, the Nobel laureate. And they used that for molecular dynamics, okay? Then there'd be, for instance, one here with a short period, perhaps they're looking at higher photon energies, uh, maybe around the cobalt or iron edges, L edges, okay, et cetera. So the new rings have many straight sections, uh, many bending magnets, um, and the electron beam, it says tightly controlled electron beam. It's relatively small. The second generation facilities look kind of the same, maybe not so many straight sections, maybe just a few, but the electron beam wasn't so tightly constrained. It was kind of large and the divergence, the, you know, it's a, it's a bunch of electrons. So they also, not, it has a certain size to it and which actually is not a circle here. It's more of an, it is an ellipse. And the electrons are not all parallel, but they're not all traveling exactly parallel to each other. There's a little variation in that just because they do collide with each other. Their, their effective mass is so large when they collide, they don't get sent out of the ring, but it spreads the angles around a little bit. So when they say tightly controlled electron beam, we will talk about this some more. Uh, it's a matter of making the electron beam relatively small and, and as minimal divergence, okay? So with such a ring, uh, we'll come up with quantitatively, what does this mean? The radiation is brighter. The radiation per unit area and per unit solid angle is higher, okay? And it's what sold the original third generation rings of which ESRF and the ALS were the first two, okay? Uh, it turns out they have interesting coherence properties because the size and the divergence, not quite a match for coherence, but, but uh, decent, okay? And there's just a comment here that fourth generation light sources will have even smaller and more tightly controlled electron beams. So the ALS, all of these facilities, as you'll see in a, if not today, uh, Tuesday, all of the major facilities are having a long shutdown to change that electron beam to be even tighter controlled, closer to a circle um, wherever possible and less divergence. And they're doing that so that they can get better coherence properties. So you, for any of you who are aware of the ALS upgrade, I think it's still two years away before they have a major shutdown for at least a year, but they're going to replace the, the ring and the way they do the injection so they, that they get a much tighter electron beam. I'll show you in a moment. Uh, having a lot of straight sections and a lot of bending magnets, you can support all different kinds of science. So it's, uh, it's actually, it's a cultural house for different kinds of science. When you hang out there and you have a cup of coffee there, you meet scientists doing all kinds of interesting things. So biologists, chemists, physicists, you name it, geologists, they're all there. So these are shown, these straight sections this is an undulator with a five centimeter period, an undulator with a 10 centimeter period. Ah, this is the chemical dynamics one I mentioned with Y.T. Lee, okay? Some for photo emission. This is a wiggler. So I've been downplaying the wigglers, but they are there, okay? Uh, this is an elliptically polarizing undulator. It's got two different undulator sections orthogonal to each other, so the electron goes through and rather than just oscillate in one plane, it can oscillate in either plane or elliptically, circularly, etc. So all the rings have different kinds of features. This is an ALS kind of 
soft x-ray EUV, mostly soft x-ray ring, okay? The APS or ESRF, harder x-rays, you'd see more things about crystallography or things like that, protein crystallography, although there is some here at the ALS. Does, could someone make a comment now? No? I had a, I had a, you could explain. Um, sorry, the, uh, just like the U5, U10, those social, are those where um, essentially you're, you're tapping off the beam itself for your particular um, purpose? It's where the electrons are going through this vacuum chamber, which isn't shown here. So they're going around and around and around, and they're going in a bunch. And the bunch has maybe, maybe 10 to the eighth, or maybe even more, 10 to the ninth electrons in the bunch. In each bunch, and their bunch, and there's a whole bunch of bunches going around one after the other. And let's just look at one bunch. It comes out of this U5, goes through a bending magnet, and goes through the next. U5. So this is a periodic magnet structure of the kind I showed you in the diagram a few minutes ago with a five centimeter period. The electrons go through, the radiation continues to go straight, uh, but the electrons feel a vertical magnetic field from a bending magnet. Little V cross B term directs the electron bunch into the next straight section while the x-rays go straight ahead. So now they go through another periodic magnet structure, but this one with a slightly longer period to get a lower, longer wavelength, lower photon energy, suitable for chemical dynamics. Did I answer your question? Right. Or, yes, you sir. Know? And yes, sir. And then the other, the other, the follow-up is then can you do several experiments in one time? Right? Yeah. So that's the gigantic thing here. The beam energy is fixed. The gamma is fixed, but the periods are not fixed. So all of these people can be operating at the same time. All of these wigglers and all of the bending magnets all going at the same time. So you'll see just tons of people as you walk around the ring. Really good, really good question. Thank you. Thank you. If somebody else was going to say something? Yes, I was going to ask uh, if there was a reason for the, uh, the time structure, the bunching, like you said. Um, well, um, what is it? it's not so much of a reason as it is going to be. When you start accelerating the electrons, there's a natural um, um, breaking up. If you had a very long electron beam, uh, it just, the, the accelerate, here's a better way to say it. Somewhere in here, oh, it says RF, radio frequency. So there is an axial electric field here. It's, um, it's not microwaves, it's a little bit longer, but uh, it's a radio frequency cavity. Um, not too different from what you might have to accelerate electrons in an, an, a, in an FM radio antenna to make them up, go up and down. But anyway, there's an oscillating electric field here. Uh, so the electrons enter, well, here it is, there's a linac, linear accelerator, boosts up the energy, and then directs, it in, directs the electrons into the ring, the so-called injection section. And so they're coming in, and they go around the ring, and they lose, they lose a little bit of energy. The electrons, when they're going through here, are radiating photons. So they're losing a little bit of energy. It's not much, but they do lose a little bit. So the values of gamma, for instance, this starts to be a little bit of a spread in gamma. It's a spread of something like one part in 10 to the fourth or something, relatively small. But after going around uh, the ring, some electrons have lost more energy than others. There's a little bit of a randomness in the process. So the electrons, as they're coming through the, around the ring and they come to this axial RF, the RF is a sort of, it's a phasing thing. It's an electric field, which is oscillating back and forth on axis. And it's timed, or it naturally times itself, that if there are any electrons which arrive a little bit late, they get more of an electric field and it boosts them up to catch up with the others. So every time they go around, whichever electrons have lost a little bit more energy, they get a little bit of a boost here. And this process, this radio frequency has, uh, I think it's at 500 megahertz is the frequency. And so it winds up imposing 
a separate, it winds up bunching the electrons. And so um, uh, switch 500 um, megahertz to time, I think it comes out to 20 nanoseconds. Am I right? 20 nanoseconds? We'll see it. But at any rate, you wind up with bunches of electrons sort of 20 nanoseconds apart. And it's all set by this oscillating radio frequency of 500 megahertz. So it produces, it, it would take, if there were a stream of electrons coming in, this would break them up in short order into little bunches. I'm sorry, they're separated every two nanoseconds, right? So 500 megahertz means peak to peak two nanoseconds. And that's what this, it gives it a time structure. Most people do not use the time structure. 99.9% .9 of the users at the ring, they don't even know there is a time structure. They just see the average properties because their, their measurements are made over seconds or milliseconds, things like that. You know, how much, how long does it take to get a photo emission spectra or an absorption spectra or things like that? It's a little bit long, so they don't see the time structure. But some people do use the time structure. They'll use one pulse to create something and the next pulse to probe it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So this is just some examples of the kinds of science that people do at synchrotron. So there's lots of surface science, for instance, at the ALS, a lot of magnetic materials. Their L edges are quite interesting, uh, have an interesting uh, relationship to the magnetic properties, lots of materials, chemistry, uh, environmental science, um, spatially and you know uh, spectral studies of some um, molecular, what should I say, sludge, something they took out of the bottom of the bay, okay, or some uh, bird sanctuary flyby um, environmental uh, sump out in the Central Valley. People will take samples there and they'll come and they'll look for what property, what things are in there because of the wash off from, um, from what's the phrase, the from the chemicals which are used throughout the silicon uh, throughout the central valley to grow things well um, th those pollutants wind up in our water and in our bay and people look at those uh, at the ALS with the so-called stixum the scanning transmission x-ray microscope okay there's protein crystallography done at the ALS it's done more at the heart x-ray facilities because the protein crystallography is best done at let's say eight to 20 or even more KEV. So a good 10 or 20 um, KEV. Um, but the ALS with a strong bending magnet can also do protein crystallography and they do. So for instance, they have been working on the coronavirus at the ALS. They never shut down. They have been going the whole time analyzing the um, the, the, the protein structure. So biomicroscopy is done, chemical dynamics. Well, uh, this is, I guess, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question. So oftentimes when I'm working at 7.3.3, uh, um, we have what's called like a beam dump where the x-rays, you know, stop coming. Um, so I guess for my own curiosity, like what might cause the beam to go down? Like, you know, what process within sort of the ALS you know, causes them to shut it down. And so it's just, I've always been curious about that. Oh, you mean if something goes wrong and they lose the beam? Yeah, exactly. And, the, and, the ele and they, right, because they have concrete shielding like crazy all around here. The concrete shielding is, uh, I don't know, it must be two feet thick or something like that. So what might happen is the, the way the electrons are controlled to go around the ring is there is magnet structures everywhere. It's complicated business of magnet structures. The whole ring is just jam packed with different kind of magnet structures, so-called dipoles to do the turning, but quadrupoles, as they're called, to keep the electrons on axis. So they're going around and around. Suppose one of those magnet structure fails, right? They're maintained by a current in, in some wires to produce the magnetic field that gives the curve just the right curvature so they go into the next straight section. Suppose this magnet fails, which is just leading into your 7.3 beam line, then those electrons are not going to turn. They're going to go smacking into the wall. And their GEV energies, right, the two GEV, so they can produce x-rays 
pretty much up to 2 GeV. But they can get through a lot of concrete. Okay, so even a, if, for instance, even a lead shield would not do much. It would go through, you know, a quarter inch of lead like it wasn't there. So good, thank you, good question. And you could see some of the other details here in the meanwhile. Anyone else have a question? Because we might not come back to this. Uh, yes, I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, it, uh, so sometimes there will be a different ice station for the same beam line. So is it possible for different ice station uh, have a totally different photon energy? For example, uh, I know uh, Nitrate 2 and Nitrate 1, they use X-ray in different energy. For example, Nitrate 2 used like hundreds of electron volts, or Nitrate 1 used like 4,000. No, this so is a great question. So if you're coming off an undulator, the undulator gets tuned to a certain energy and whosoever, whoever has the lead beam time, they get to choose the beam energy for their experiment. They want to look at the iron L edge, let's say, so they need 700 and whatever, 707 or 708 EV. If anybody else can operate uh, also at the same time and use that same energy, they can go, but otherwise one or the other has the beam time and the other is shut down, you get the night shift or something like that. But if you're on a bending magnet and 931 and 932 are on bending magnets, the bending magnet puts out a spray of all different photon energies as a function of angle. So in fact, actually at each of the bending magnets, there, there are usually two ports that come out and they both have a full spectrum. Bending magnet radiation is not a narrow spectrum. It's a very broad spectrum. In a moment, we'll see it. And so um, you could have two people, uh, two groups side by side, both using b radiation from the same bending magnet, but taking it open, making two side by side little openings, a little bigger than a pinhole, but radiation coming through and they're both full spectrum. They go from the infra infrared, well, certainly, certainly from the ultraviolet to getting into pretty almost hard x-rays in both cases. And so you'll put a monochromator here, a 931, on something that's interesting for what your team is doing. The other team will put a monochromator here to take a slice for what they're interested in. So I think we'll probably have a diagram in just a moment. I'll show you what we mean. Okay, so we're gonna start with undulator radiation, it says. We've already talked about this and this. Uh, these are just some convenient things. I, it's a little bit of an interruption, but they're convenient units um, conversions, actually. So here's your gamma. This is your Lorentz factor, which accelerated people often write V over C as beta. So this becomes square root of one minus beta squared, where beta is V over C. Just need to be aware of that. It's going to crop up. What is gamma? It's the electron energy divided by the rest energy, okay? If you plug in all the units for these things, this is a non-dimensional number. If you plug in all the things, gamma is 1957 times the energy of the electrons in GeV. So the ALS has a 1.9 GeV energy, so it's just about two. So uh, this would be just 4,000. But I, I should have put this in brackets. Maybe I'll go back and fix it, okay? So ESRF, we said, was 6 GeV. So it would be pretty close to 12,000, okay? So these are just some units. This is a conversion which we will use to death in this class. What is the conversion between photon energy and wavelength, lambda? So we call from the homework. This is basically F lambda equals C, but uh, put in units of photon energy and wavelength. <laughs> I put so many significant figures, so that's always enough for your homework, especially if you're doing an experiment with spectroscopy, where you're measuring wavelengths to better than one part in 10 to the fourth, maybe one ten part in 10 to the fifth, you need an extra significant figure so the round off makes sense, okay? And this is a similar conversion uh, between watts and photons per second. How many, how many photons per second you get in a watt depends on the wavelength or the photon energy, so this says, put it in in units. So if the, wa if the wavelength was two nanometers, this says replace this with a number two. Okay, so at two nanometers, one watt produces 
10 times 10 to the 15th photons per second. Anyway, we'll, you'll find them quite useful, so keep them nearby. So here's our undulator structure that we talked about. Actually, what I want to do is I want to jump forward a little bit. I'll come back to this in just a minute. I'm hoping we'll get done with this part today. But I want to help answer the question before about the bending magnets and see if I can catch that. Whoa, bending magnets a long way away. Yeah, so sorry about that. This is what bending magnet radiation looks like. So there may be straight sections to either side, but there'll be bending, uh, bending a magnetic field that will just bend the electrons into the next straight section. And you can have several ports. There's enough room to have several ports. You can have more than two actually, but at the ALS they'll have two, okay? And each one of them has this, excuse me, really broad spectrum. So this is the photon flux coming out uh, in photons per second for a typical ALS bending magnet. And this is the energy coverage of the radiation coming out. It's very, very broad. So you could have two nearby neighbors, one wanting to work at a photon energy of one keV and another one at maybe, maybe 200 eV, okay, photon energies. So, um, so some chemistry, some magnetic materials, some protein crystallography out here. And um, so that's what a bending magnet spectrum looks like. It's because it's, there's not a lot of oscillation. It's just the electron just passes you. It's like you saw it for less than a cycle. You get a really broad spectrum. While we're looking at it, uh, if you were to say, where, where, what photon energy, let me rephrase that. For what photon energy is 50% of the radiated energy above that? and 50% of the radiated energy below that. Well, there's a big spread here. The photon energies are lower, so you need more of them to get 50%. This dividing line is called the critical photon energy. It means, just as, as I said, 50% of the radiated um, energy or power is above, 50% of the radiated energy is below, and for the ALS, the critical uh, photon energy is just over three, 3 keV. So at 3 keV, and then it's dropping kind of quickly. But you know, if you go out to 4 e crit, you're getting up to 12 kilovolts and you're only down about a factor of 10. So that's why at the ALS, even though it's a low energy machine, 1.9 GeV, you can still go out to 10 kilovolts with a bending magnet because you can get out to, at, for instance, at 4 E crit, this is a critical energy, 12 kilovolts, you can do great protein crystallography there, and you're only down a factor of 10. So it works, people do it. Is any question or further comment? Okay, I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna go backwards the slow way because I don't wanna lose this. And by the way, there are some slides in here we're not going to deal with. I'm just going to tell you what they are. Not in the beginning here, but later on, maybe tomorrow. But I don't want to take them out. I want, to, I want them there so you know that these concepts exist or material is there. Okay, so here's our electron going through the undulator with some um, very high energy, with some very high value of gamma. And again, undu the undulated period is lambda u, et cetera. And we want to find out what, what is the X-ray energy on axis. And so here's our geometry. The electrons are coming through. They're oscillating in and out of the board as they go through because there's a V cross B term, a Lorentz force driving an acceleration in the out of the plane uh, direction. So V is in the Z direction, magnetic field is in the Y direction. The oscillation is in and out of the board, but as it's oscillating and radiating, it's moving forward. And it's moving forward in a highly relativistic manner as shown here. And capital N again is the number of periods, okay? So in the frame of reference, 
moving with the electron. So imagine that you're, you're with the electron as it comes by. You actually feel this magnet structure going by you at close to the speed of light. But um, in the frame of, um, did I say that right? In the frame of reference, moving with the electron, it feels a certain period. It, it feels the magnetic field varying, but it's varying in this frame of reference that um, the, this is like the contracted meter stick. The electron feels a period of lambda u over gamma. It's like, it's like you were with the electron moving along and a meter stick went flying by, okay? If the meter stick went flying by, we know it's Lorentz contracted. So the marks on the meter stick would be contracted from lambda u, whatever they are, to lambda u over gamma, okay? So that's one of the main features of relativistic motion. So the electron is going to radiate at the Lorentz contracted wavelength. So uh, it, in the frame of reference, moving with the electron, it's oscillating with a certain frequency, but the wavelength associated with that is this lambda u over gamma. And how long it, it radiates a wave train? How many cycles of a wave train does it radiate? Well, as the electron goes through, it radiates, n, it radiates a wave train of n cycles. So what we saw from the last lecture about um, Fourier analysis, if it has n cycles of radiation, the bandwidth is gonna be roughly one over n, okay? Relative, so this is just flipped around. Uh, relative spectral uh, bandwidth would normally be written as delta lambda over lambda, one over n, but we'll, we'll write, I'll, I'll often write things upside down, so I don't have to write one over n, okay? So the, in the frame of reference, moving with the electron, it sees a meter stick-like contraction, a Lorentz contraction, to a wavelength lambda u, period of the magnet, over gamma. That's what it feels, and therefore that's the frequency that it oscillates, or wavelength that it radiates at, okay? So that's in the frame of reference moving with the electron, but our sample is in the frame of the observer. So this thing, although it's radiating at this wavelength, lambda prime, it there's a gigantic relativistic Doppler shift towards the sample. It's moving towards us, so it's gonna to get to an even shorter wavelength. And the Doppler shortened wavelength is whatever this wavelength was here, the wavelength on, on axis in the frame of the sample, the observer, would be this formula. So this is the Doppler, relativistically correct Doppler formula. If gamma was equal to one, if it wasn't relativistic, this would look very familiar to them, okay? Uh, what's not shown here, um, but I, there are some slides. Am I gonna show them to you? Yeah, I'm gonna show you um, some slides about how you substitute this in here and do these expansions and you will find that the wavelength, the wavelength observed on axis, on axis, the shortest wavelength, is going to turn out to be lambda u over two gamma squared multiplied by this factor. We're only interested in very small angles. The small angle approximation uh, is going to bring in this term, okay? And this is due to the Doppler. The, you know, the Doppler shift is angle dependent. This is the off-axis component. On axis, theta is zero, and the wavelength is just lambda u over two gamma squared. But off axis, this is a component of it, okay? So somewhat longer as we saw in that, that figure we looked at before to give us some physical motivation. This is, this is the wavelengths that we're gonna see as a function of angle. Now there's a little correction we have to make and we will make it in a moment, but this is called the undulator equation. It's missing a piece and which we're, I'm going to tell you about, and we'll probably get to it today, okay? And that is, 
Um, when the electron is coming through here, if you increase the magnetic field, let's say you take your magnet structure, the upper part and the lower part, and you push them down a little bit closer together to get a stronger magnetic field, then the V cross B term will be stronger and the electrons will spend more time going off axis, okay? It's gonna slow it down. It's gonna take it longer to do its N oscillations. And um, as a result, it's gonna be a longer wavelength. So when you close a magnet structure down, and this is done at the ALS or all these facilities, each of the, one, each of the undulators around the ring is independently controllable and they can tune it up and down so they can do spectroscopic absorption measurements or scattering measurements or whatever for some continuum of wavelengths or photon energies. Anyway, when that happens, it slows down the electric field. So there's a measure of this magnetic field is, is missing in here. It's not showing the fact that as we increase the magnetic field, the electrons actually slow down and therefore gamma, the effective value of gamma changes a little bit. The electrons are going through more slowly. Gamma is lower and it occurs in both cases. And so it brings in a measure uh, of the magnetic field. And this cap capital K is a measure, is a non-dimensional measure of the magnetic field strain. And we're going to derive this formula and then we're gonna go back and do a correction to see where does this magnetic field come in when you calculate how did the magnetic field change the value of gamma on axis? So does this raise some questions or <coughs> does someone want to comment? I, I could say one other thing, you know, for a charged particle in a magnetic field, no electric field here, right? If there was an electric field, the charged particle could be accelerated, slowed down or sped up. But if you just have a magnetic field and it, it's variable to some degree, when the electron goes through, it may be made to oscillate, but it never changes its energy. A charged particle does not change its energy in a magnetic field. It only changes its direction. So the total, so gamma is representing an energy and here, when you go through, if you increase the magnetic field, so the electrons are going off axis, oscillating to larger amplitude, okay? That means there's some sort of transverse velocity. The velocity is a constant here in these magnetic fields. And um, what used to be, if the magnetic field was weak, there was a certain velocity in this direction, almost the speed of light, but as you bring in the magnetic fields and they st the electrons start oscillating back and forth, that energy, that component of velocity is coming from the axial velocity because the total velocity, let's say V squared plus VX squared is a constant. So when we start increasing the oscillating amplitude uh, in the magnetic fields, uh, we necessarily slow it down. And we'll have to make a little correction for this gamma and this gamma. And when we do that, we'll change the gamma in these two places and bingo, we're gonna get, this is the undulator equation. So this is an important one. Uh, in the synchrotron radiation, it's as important a formula as we're gonna say. And this non-dimensional measure of the magnetic field is K. It's the magnetic field, the undulator period, and these natural constants. Uh, just some, um, some social aspects of synchrotron radiation. This non-dimensional parameter K was, uh, invent, was described in a, in a uh, publication, was first described, this undulator equation was first written in this form with some non-dimensional measure of the magnetic field uh, with this capital K by a, um, a former Stanford graduate student named Brian Kincaid, with a K, and he published his paper. He was the sole author also, like, like John Mady on the FEL. Brian, also a, a great uh, student, graduate student, published his paper and introduced this non-dimensional measure, K. And he, by the way, uh, for, quite, for several years was the director 
of the ALS. Okay, so here's our, um, where, where does the lambda u over two gamma squared come? Where does the two gamma squared come from? So we saw that the electron sees a Lorentz contracted period as it goes through the magnet structure. We said lambda u over gamma. And it emits a radiation at a frequency. So this is F lambda equals C, so C over lambda. And so this is the frequency that it's oscillating at in its frame of reference, okay? So again, this was the um, Lorentz contracted wavelength, but the frequency is increased, okay? Um, observed in the laboratory frame of reference, where our sample is, the radiation is Doppler shifted, and this is the Doppler shifted formula. We normally write it in terms of wavelengths, but it's more convenient here to do it in terms of frequencies. So if this is the fr frequency in the frame, in the frame of reference moving with the electrons, this will be the Doppler shifted frequency seen in the laboratory. So it's this F prime, and these are the factors, okay? And so if you put these things in, if you put this in here and here, this is the frequency that you're gonna see. In the end, we're gonna convert these to H bar omegas and get photon energies. But this is the frequency then, just combine all these factors, um, beta we have in, is V over C. In a moment, we're going to say that B, beta is V over C is very close to one. And we're going to say that actually we're only interested in small angles. So for instance, on axis, we'll do this in two steps. What if on axis, what do we get? And then we'll go back and we'll make a small angle approximation. So on axis, this is the frequency observed by our sample. Now, beta is V over C. And I told you that V over C in this highly relativistic case is very close to the speed of light. So this one minus beta, this is, this is looking like a pole. It's looking like one over zero. So we need to deal with this. And this is where, uh, so this is the same expression as we had before. But so here's something. Um, gamma, by definition, is 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. So I want to solve for what is a 1 minus beta. I square both sides and I get gamma squared equals uh, 1 over 1 minus beta squared, which I factor into two parts. 1 minus beta has a 1 minus beta and a 1 plus beta. The 1 plus beta is a 2. So close to 2, we'll never doubt it. So we've got that gamma squared is equal to this factor, and now we can solve for one minus beta. Okay, one minus beta is going to be one over two gamma squared. Okay, so from this formula here, where we were wondering what is this one minus beta, it's, this is almost zero, so this is gonna make the frequency very high. This is how high. So now making this substitution here, we get that the frequency is two gamma squared C over lambda u. And the observed wavelength is lambda u over two gamma squared. So that's where the gamma squared came from. One was from the Lorentz contraction going to the, um, to, uh, do the, uh, the, to observe the oscillation in the moving frame going with the electron. And the other gamma, actually two gamma, was from a Doppler shift. So we have gotten the main part of our radiation on axis lambda u over two gamma squared and putting some numbers in. Uh, for ESRF, here's a typical undulator period. This is their gamma. They're getting wavelengths of 1.5 angstrom from an undulator. Okay, so that's very nice. That's on axis. What about off axis? And then we'll do the correction for magnetic field. So, okay, um, this was the formula we had, and we took cosine theta was equal to one, but now we want to say, well, what is it slightly off axis? And we're going to replace this by one minus theta squared. We don't need to go through all of these steps um, here while I'm speaking, but you can accept my word and check me later that this formula with this angular approximation comes down to this, okay? And so that's the frequency. And again, if we switch to wavelength, this is what we get for the wavelength. And this is to a high degree of accuracy. These angles are gonna be micro radians where we get our X-rays or EUV. So this is looking like our undulator equation. It's just missing the magnetic field part, but it's got the gammas here. So this is pretty, pretty much 
the undulator equation. Ah, uh, yes. What I, before I make the correction for the magnetic field, with this, so this is probably all we'll do today. I'd like to know what angle theta contains a one over n bandwidth, because I think that's all we're interested. If I, again, if I'm looking at, let's say, a cobalt edge at 800 and something eV, I'm not interested in 900 eV photons. I don't want them hitting my sample. I want a narrow band. So probably one over n would be the most I'll be interested. I'll probably use a monochromator to make it even narrower. So what I'd like to know is what angle would contain a one over n bandwidth. So I'm gonna write this equation twice. Once when theta is zero, I'll, maybe I'll call that lambda zero, and then at some larger angle, lambda plus delta lambda, and I'm gonna choose delta lambda over lambda to be one over n and find out and solve for theta. So here's the algebra, okay? We're going to have n oscillations, and we are going to be interested in a bandwidth, relative spectral bandwidth, 1 over n. So I'm writing that undulator equation twice, once with delta lambda and with the, the angle, and once when the angle is 0, so delta lambda is 0, that would be this equation. So I've got this equation and this equation, one written for some off-axis angle and one for on-axis, and I've got two equations and I can divide through and I can solve. I can, for instance, I can replace, I can divide through or do it in various ways. If I divide through, this will be one plus delta lambda over lambda, and this will be one, um, the, the, the coefficient out in front, the lambda u over two gamma squared is gonna cancel. So I'll have one plus delta lambda over lambda equals one plus gamma squared theta squared, just make the identification. This simplifies then to delta lambda over lambda, we've just solved it, is approximately equal to gamma squared theta squared. So, okay, I'm interested in not just any old bandwidth, I'm interested in a relatively narrow bandwidth, one over n. So I'm gonna replace this by one over n, and I'm gonna call that the central radiation cone. So I'm gonna make this definition. The central radiation cone uh, I write this way, I replace this by one over n, and now if I solve for the central radiation cone, this is it. So in fact, the radiation within that interesting bandwidth is one over gamma times square root of n. I call it the central radiation cone. For the ALS, if gamma is 4,000, and let's say n was 100, just to make it easy, the central radiation cone would be one over 40,000. So if I multiply that top and bottom by 25, I would get 25 microradians. So a typical angle at the ALS is going to be 25 microradian, central cone angle defined as containing um, a one over n spectral bandwidth. So these go together. Whenever I show a formula for the central radiation cone like this, it'll always imply a bandwidth delta lambda over lambda. Uh, so I think that was just algebra, but it's um, so easy to follow in the sense of the algebra, but the basic idea was we got a gamma squared shortening of wavelength because we, and the way we understood that, there are more complicated ways to do it, was we first moved to the frame of reference moving with the electron where the period of the magnet structure was um, Lorentz contracted, just like the meter stick was that we learned in other classes, okay? And then that radiation is, is moving towards our sample at almost the speed of light. So there's a, another, there's a relativistic Doppler shift and it brought in another gamma, in fact, a two gamma. So we got on axis lambda u over two gamma squared, and we found that the bandwidth one over n bandwidth was within this central cone angle. So that's a brief summary of what we did. Um, yeah, so in the frame of reference, moving with the electron, it's just oscillating n cycles and it has a little spectrum breadth to it just by the Fourier 
uh, analysis of n cycles of radiation. That's in the frame of reference moving with the electron. And the laboratory frame of reference, there's actually, you remember going off the large angle, we, we could have had microwaves or infra, infrared or microwaves off axis. And so in the frame of reference moving with the axis, we're only interested in a part very close to the axis, microradians we just learned, and off axis there's, there's all these longer wavelengths. There's a gigantic amount of power that we're going to throw away just to get the part we want. And how can we get the part we want? Well, we could put a little pinhole here. If we put a little pinhole here, we'll block the longer wavelengths, okay? And we'll just get the part that we want on axis. So you can actually make a pinhole aperture and you can make that become a, a sort of a crude spectrometer. You could also put that radiation onto a monochromator. So for soft X-rays or EUV, a grading monochromator at some angle of incidence. For the hard x-rays, you'd have a crystal monochromator here, okay? But basically, the, the grading or the crystal takes this incident radiation and spreads it out as a function, photon energy or wavelength as a function of angle. And if you put an exit slip here, this becomes a monochromator and you get the narrow part coming out. And these two are completely equivalent. So this is how we're going to we're going to actually do a little um, calculation of the of the motion of the electron using the Lorentz, the relativistically correct version of the Lorentz uh, force equation, F equals m a, okay, where the momentum now relativistically correct is gamma m v, and this is what we'll do in the next lecture, and what we're going to find is that the velocity in the z direction is slowed down on average by the magnetic field. And that'll bring in this non-dimensional k, and we will wind up, um, we'll, we'll solve for the velocity, the oscillating velocity of the x-rays, and we'll notice that the sum of the, all the velocities has to be a constant, so there's gonna be a z direction modification, and there's gonna be a slowing down and there's also going to be some double frequency is going to bring in harmonics and we're going to wind up adding a we're going to take our uh, the gamma that we're going to see that the velocity on axis is changed it's slowed down from what it was before and we're going to take this and we're going to define an effective lorentz um, factor in the axial direction okay and um, it depends on that k squared, the magnetic field. And when we replace the gamma with a gamma star, so that now we get the correct um, Lorentz contraction and the correct Doppler shift, that's what these two were for. When we put them in, we get this, this is the undulator equation. So that's what we're gonna do in the next class. We'll start here. Does anyone wanna raise any issues before? We break. Um, I had a, oh, go ahead. Okay, um, so I guess I was wondering, actually in practice at one of these facilities, when they're tuning the wavelength that you want, are they using um, the spacing between the magnets or are they using this, uh, the strength of the field like N? Um, no, yeah, good question. Really excellent question. Uh, I I would go back to the diagram, but you know the magnetic field. It had it has this periodicity, okay? It's some lambda u. That's fixed. That magnetic undulator is not going to change, okay, for a decade, okay. What's going to change is the opening, the gap between the upper and lower parts, okay. So by changing that, you'll increase or decrease the magnetic field on axis. So that's how you're going to, um, that's how you will tune the radiation coming through. Should I go back to the diagram? Would you like me to do that? Oh, that, that's okay, I get it. I just was wondering, okay. like, I guess I wasn't sure if how fixed the periodicity of the magnets was. Yeah, so the period of the magnet structures is fixed. It's, let's say, five centimeters for one straight section, 10 or eight centimeter period in the other, and they're fixed. What's not fixed 
is the opening, the gap between the top and the bottom. And by the way, these things are three to five meters long. And so opening and closing them with precision, so you're not introducing tilts or anything. It's a lot of engineering went in to um, making these undulator magnet structures. And that's, by the way, so that's how you would tune your wavelength. How would you know that you were actually at the wavelength that you wanted to be at? Well, one of the things you could do is if you were going to do an experiment near the characteristic absorption edges of some material, put a thin piece of that material in and see as you're opening and closing the gap, when does the absorption suddenly change coming through the material? So then you would know, okay, I'm exactly at the iron, the iron K absorption edge, okay? I'm calibrated. And now you can move, you can use the formulas after that. Did that make sense? Okay. Anybody else want to throw one out? Yeah, so I had a question when we are talking about our, uh, when you're selecting your desired frequency, uh, you said there were two options. One, you could either use like a pinhole or like a monochromatic grating. Yes. Uh, you said they're practically the same. So why would you pick the monochromatic grating? It just seems like an extra step that provides more sources of error. Uh, the monochromator gives you a lot more control. So this is, you put, in, you put an aperture in and you get what you get. And um, okay. But here, once you do it, um, for instance, you can then change the grating angle and you you can, uh, or move the exit slit, and you can change this. And you can also change how narrow it is. Here you're gonna get a certain, this is very good because it's very efficient. You know, it's a, for the photons you want, it's 100% efficient, but the bandwidth that you get, you don't have so much control over. Here, you have much more control on the wavelengths you're going to observe. Um, and, and how wide they are. If you narrow this slit down, you could get to something narrower. So I think the monochromator just gives you more control, and it's what people mostly do. Not completely, but what they mostly do. But that's also a great question, and I'll give it some thought, because uh, I think I could have s said that better, but um, maybe we'll come back to it uh, in the next class. It's a good question. Thank you. Yes, can I ask one more question going to kind of- Yeah, please. Um, so that using that grading, do you have kind of a general idea of like how much power you're gonna end up losing in the wavelength range you want? Like, or is it gonna absorb a lot of it or not? Yeah, really good question. So when you put a monochromator in there, a grading in there, first of all, you're gonna, you have a certain power coming out of your undulator and you're gonna take, take a narrow spectral slice. So what you're gonna lose, right? The narrower the, the narrower the slice you want, if you want one part in a thousand, and this was sort of one part in a hundred, you just lost a factor of 10, right? You've only got 10% of the radiation, but as you're implying, the monochromator is not perfectly efficient either. And so for instance, for hard X-rays, let's say 10, more than 10 keV, you'd use a crystal monochromator, and those monochromators have very high efficiencies, close to approaching 100%, certainly over 90%. But in the soft x-ray region, uh, we, we will give you some numbers on this uh, probably the following week, but typically, you know, they're like 30% efficient, okay? And there'll be other mirrors in here, in fact, there's a whole beam line uh, built around this whole thing. And every mirror that you have has maybe 80% reflectivity. You know, we've seen that glancing incidence reflectivity can be very high, but that's for a perfectly smooth mirror, no roughness, no carbon buildup over months or something like that. So in the end, um, we will do this next week. We have some slides. I didn't put them there yet, I don't think. But at any rate, we'll see, we'll put in a, an efficiency for the monochromator or for the whole beam line. We'll put an efficiency, Greek letter eta, capital eta. And in fact, um, there's a wordy homework problem coming, which involves just that concept. You know? Okay, these are really great questions.
Uh, we can handle another if anyone has one. Yeah, so with those questions, I'd like to jump right ahead to some of those interesting aspects, but I think they'll probably wait another two lectures. Okay, so uh, what is today? Thursday, so see you Tuesday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.